Hi there. Welcome to AP U.S. History with Lennox, and today is part two of our venture into Washington's presidency. Now, I'll be honest, I thought I could do this in two videos, but it's going to take three. So without wasting any more of your time, let's get started. During Washington's administration is when we see the development of our first political party systems. We had had division in our country before, if you think back to the Constitutional Convention and the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists, but those really weren't political parties, those were political ideologies. Now we're going to see more of a division between those ideologies where we actually see two independent groups forming, and they're going to be led by members of Washington's cabinet, Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of Treasury, and Thomas Jefferson, the Secretary of State. Now, a little bit of context, if you remember correctly, coming into Washington's presidency, one of the biggest challenges they faced was the national debt. And Hamilton was put in charge of coming up with a solution to that debt. Now, one of the big I guess sticking points between him and Jefferson was the idea of the federal assumption of state debts. Remember, Alexander Hamilton wanted the federal government to assume all state debt, basically take on that debt, and then that would help build credit for the United States. Well, Jefferson wanted none of that because a lot of the southern states were in the process of paying off those debts, and he was also concerned with this financial plan that what's going to happen is the federal government would become too strong. Also remember that they were debating the interpretation of the U.S. Constitution. Alexander Hamilton believed in a very loose construction of it, whereas Jefferson and James Madison believed in a strict interpretation. These are dividing lines between the two political parties. Now, one of the big things that's going to help raise revenue for our country is taxation. Hamilton is going to introduce the whiskey tax. This is an excise tax that Hamilton is hoping will reduce the national debt. This tax on whiskey is going to lead to the Whiskey Rebellion, the first rebellion we face under the new U.S. Constitution. Now, it was an excise tax, which means that it's a tax on anything that is sold or produced for sale. So it didn't really matter if you were purchasing whiskey or you were just making it. The tax man is coming for you, baby, and people weren't happy about it specifically people in the Appalachian region. It really wasn't uh, popular with these Western farmers. And the main reason for this was during the 1700s going into the 1800s, whiskey was seen as a poor man's drink. In today's world, whiskey is seen as the drink of gentlemen. But back in the early parts of the United States, it wasn't that way at all. In fact, many people produced whiskey almost as a side hustle, like a second job. They would grow corn, and with the excess corn that they couldn't sell at market, they would actually distill that into whiskey, and then they could use that to sell to make an extra buck. They also used whiskey for currency in the western frontier of the United States. It was almost like a bartering system, whereas if you didn't have cash, which was running low during this part of our republic due to the, the challenges of the economy, you could use whiskey to purchase goods in, in general stores and stuff like that. If you go into the local store for a, a farm community and you couldn't afford to buy grain, you could trade your whiskey for grain. So whiskey was actually a form of money at the time. Well, the farmers in western Pennsylvania kind of felt targeted by this attack because they did rely so much on whiskey for currency and as an opportunity to make extra funds. And it was also what we call a regressive tax, where basically the more you produced in time, the less you would pay in taxes. But if you just produced a small amount, you are going to pay more in taxes. And let me show you what I mean. These Western farmers were typically just producing whiskey by the gallon, just using their excess grain to make it. And so the tax was set up where you paid the tax based on the gallon of whiskey you made. And the more you made, the more you would have to pay. So if you, if you produce one gallon, you might pay a 3% tax. But if you produce a whole bunch more, you're still paying that 3% tax as you go. 
large distillers, basically those companies that just make whiskey for a living, that's all they did, they just played a flat rate. And because they produced so much more, they might not have to pay the 3%. They might only have to pay a flat rate of 2.5%, no matter how much they made, even if it was just a gallon. And so the large companies seem to be getting a benefit that the small distillers weren't. And that's going to cause some anger amongst these Western farmers as well. You know who America's largest distiller was? Just interesting. Just some, I guess, trivia. George Washington. Washington's distillery at Mount Vernon still operates today. Get a chance. Go by and check it out. Just as a side note here, a regressive tax is one of three different taxes you may see in your lifetime. We have progressive taxes, flat taxes, and a regressive tax. With a progressive tax, typically you see the rich pay a higher percentage than the poor. So if you make $10,000 a year, you might pay a 2% tax. But if you make $100,000 a year, you might pay a 4% tax. The more money you make, the higher the tax rate you, you get charged. A flat tax rate, it doesn't matter. You can make a dollar, you can make $100 million. You're going to pay the same percentage regardless. 1% on a dollar, 10 cents. 1% on $100 million, $1 million. It's a flat tax. And then like I mentioned before, a regressive tax typically hurts the poor more than the rich because it's kind of like the more you have, the lower the rate you pay. Hamilton's is again going to be set up so that the small distillers are going to pay a greater amount of tax than the large distillers based on their profits. This is what leads to the rebellion in western Pennsylvania. Residents of western Pennsylvania, specifically those farmers and those who are distilling whiskey, are going to rise up against the government saying that this tax is unfair. We shouldn't be surprised that there's going to be a rebellion because that has been the standard operating procedure for the Americas since the late 1600s. I mean, think about it. 1676, Bacon's Rebellion. 1780, Shays' Rebellion. And now 1794, the Whiskey Rebellion. And all of those have been really the frontier farmers versus the Eastern elites. There's always been that division between the, I guess, the haves and the have-nots. Just a reminder, when you look at Bacon's and Shays' Rebellion, both of those were set in the western regions of these two states, Virginia and Massachusetts. Bacon's Rebellion was western Virginia farmers. Shays' Rebellion, western Massachusetts farmers. Now, Bacon's Rebellion dealt with the Native American attacks on land and the fact that those farmers were trying to get a better quality of land and the government was not providing them the land or protection from the Native Americans. Shays Rebellion was about debt relief. The farmers had come back from fighting the American Revolution only to have their homes being foreclosed on and the government doing nothing to protect them. And both of these actually resulted in those who were rebelling having success. Shays Rebellion is going to lead to the Constitutional Convention and an entirely new construction of our federal government. Bacon's Rebellion has led to the royal governor being recalled. And so, well, and I mean, look, think about it. The American Revolution, a rebellion in its own, and we won that. So rebellions had been pretty successful in the past. So why would the Whiskey Rebellion be any different? I mean, that's what these farmers were thinking. The rallying cry for the Western Pennsylvania farmers, pff, no taxation without representation. Heard that one before, right? The Western farmers said, we're not being heard in Congress. And because of that, we have to stand up and fight for our rights. Well, in truth, they were represented in Congress. They were being heard. But this idea, this new idea of a strong central government taxing them didn't sit well with a lot of people. Remember, we are only, what, 15, 16 years removed from the American Revolution, if even that much. We're not even that far away. It's only like 10 years. And taxation from a central authority still hurts. So when the U.S. government implemented this excise tax, that's going to hurt, and that's going to bring up reminders of what we just went through with England and the American Revolution.
So for the farmers, this is really no different than the Stamp Act. Okay, it's a tax that they did not agree to that's being forced upon them. So what did they do? They just pulled out the book from the past. They started tarring and feathering any tax collectors that came their way. They started protesting. Uh, this is one called Riding the Rail, in which they took the tax collector, tarred and feathered him, set him up on a fence rail, and they would parade him through the streets of all the protesters. And, of course, they'd throw stuff at him and everything like that. Well, why wouldn't they do that? That's what they did to the English tax collectors back in the 1760s, and that got the Stamp Act re repealed, so it should work here too, right? Because that's what they knew. What's going to happen, though, is this is going to escalate. It's not just going to be about the protests. It's going to escalate into something bigger. It's going to start with threats being made. You don't repeal this tax. We're going we're gonna to go to war against the United States. They're going to start burning effigies, and effigies are like representations of these tax collectors. Picture like a, a scarecrow that they're going to tie to a string and set it on fire and say, that's what we're going to do to the tax collectors. Then they're actually going to start assaulting the tax collectors, the tar and feathering, the, the riding the rail. All of that starts taking place until finally shots will be fired at the tax collectors. The government can't have this. And so in 1794, Washington is going to call out the militia. Remember, under the U.S. Constitution, he has the power to do this. Previously, Shays' Rebellion, Articles of Confederation, the government had the power to, to call out the militia. They just didn't have the power to pay them because they pay the militia with tax money and the Articles government did not have the power to tax. So they could call a militia, but who would come? You're not going to get paid. Washington calls out a militia and not just any militia. He calls out a militia of 13,000 men that are going to go up against 500 farmers. Man, if that's not a show of force... I don't know what is. And Washington is going to lead them into battle. He'll be the first president and the only president ever to lead troops onto the field of battle. Well, technically, anyway. In all honesty, Washington rode his horse out to the battlefield and said, go, and then he rode off. But he was there. I mean, I guess that counts for something. What ends up happening, it was kind of anticlimactic. The 13,000 arrive and everyone's gone. Where are the rebels? Man, when they heard 13,000 U.S. soldiers are coming, they're like, mm, out of here. And that was kind of the end of the Whiskey Rebellion. Now, this is a huge victory for the federal government. Why? Because for the first time, they were able to put down a violent insurrection within the structure of the U.S. Constitution. It kind of proved that the Constitution was going to work and it was and the validity of it is going to allow the government to function without direct interference. Washington's going to eventually pardon all those who were who had led the Whiskey Rebellion. They'd actually been put on trial and charged with treason. He's going to pardon them and say, eh, okay, no worries. Go on home back to your farm. Jefferson's going to argue this was a complete overreaction, really, and I mean I guess the guy has a point, 13,000 troops against 500 farmers, probably a little bit overkill. Um, he's going to say that an insurrection was announced, it was proclaimed, and it was armed against, but they could never find it, which is kind of what happened. We never found the, the farmers who wanted to go to war against us. When you look at all of these rebellions that have happened in our history, the Whiskey Rebellion kind of stacks up against the other two in that it was the farmers of western Pennsylvania and they're fighting against the whiskey tax. The result of it was not so much a victory for the western farmers, but it was a victory for the United States and it was a victory for the U.S. Constitution. The Whiskey Rebellion is going to mark the end of an era. This is going to be the last series of rebellions that's going to occur between like the western farmers and the eastern elites. We're not going to really see rebellions within our country be used that often because we've already proved under the power of the Constitution they're not they don't have anything to stand on. The Constitution 
is the supreme law of the land. Now what's interesting is even though the rebellion was put down, the Western farmers didn't forget what Hamilton tried to do. And his party, the Federalist Party, is going to actually start to decline in its power from that point on. The next president, John Adams, is from the Federalist Party, but he will be the last president elected in from the Federalist Party. Thomas Jefferson, the head of the Democratic Republicans, or also known as the Jeffersonian Republicans, will repeal Hamilton's excise tax when he becomes president in 1801. So the tax only lasts a short period of time. Jefferson's going to say that we're going to get our money from other places other than directly from the people. The remaining revenue of the consumption of foreign articles is paid cheerfully by those who can afford to add foreign luxuries to domestic comforts. What's he talking about? He's talking about the tariff that was part of Hamilton's financial plan, that tax on imports coming into our country. Jefferson's basically saying people can choose whether or not they want to buy imports or not. And when they buy those imports, they're recognizing that they're paying a tax on it. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. He's also going to say it may be the pleasure and pride of an American to ask what farmer, what mechanic, what laborer ever sees the tax gatherer on the United, of the United States. Jefferson was against taxes. He didn't have a problem so much with the tariffs, but taxes on the people he didn't want anything to do with. I mean, let's think about it. That was one of the main reasons we declared our independence against Great Britain. And that's what he wrote about in the Declaration of Independence. So it was his goal for the American people never to see the tax man. Well, how'd that work out? The tax man comes every year, April 15th. Like I said before, the the uh, Federalists are never going to hold the presidency after John Adams. John Adams will serve one term in the, the White House, and then he'll be replaced by three uh, Democratic Republicans serving, serving two terms that follow him. It's called the Virginia Dynasty, and that will include Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, which we'll talk about in future lectures. The lasting effects of the Whiskey Rebellion, really, believe it or not, to this day, this day today, 2020, there is still a divide between eastern and western portions of the state within the Appalachian area. This is from the elections of 2016, and you can see the western part of Virginia definitely uh, voted differently than the eastern part. When you add in West Virginia to that, it becomes even more clear, the division. Bring in other Appalachian states, such as Pennsylvania, where all this started, there is still voting patterns that fall along the, the lines of the difference between the farmers and the eastern elites still exist today all right so that's it that's washington's president primarily looking at domestic issues and the two big issues hamilton's financial plan and the whiskey rebellion they kind of go hand in hand without the whiskey rebellion we wouldn't have known that the constitution was as strong as it was but we would have never had the whiskey rebellion had Hamilton not implemented the tax as part of his financial plan. As for our next discussion, man, we're going to look at Washington's foreign policy because that's a whole other can of worms that divides the political parties even more. I appreciate you watching. If you missed something, go ahead and take it back to the beginning. Watch it again. It gets me more YouTube views. Have a great day. Bye-bye.